hope everybody's doing well. I'm trying to go live. Hopefully my signal works. Hopefully it does. Hopefully it does. <clears throat> I just have something I want to talk about um, briefly today. Um, invite, I don't, I don't think you can invite people on YouTube, but share it or do whatever we do to increase the audience. <clears throat> I want to talk today uh, just for a few minutes about um, the language of family. The language of family. Hello from Atlanta. God bless you. Good afternoon, everybody. The language of family. Because, you know, when we get through doing all of this talking and all of this teaching and having all of these discussions centered around relationships, <clears throat> Excuse me, I'm kind of dealing with something. Um, it's futile if if the end result, you know, is really not about family. And I know that there, you know, this is a very different uh, culture and a very different generation, a very different mindset. And people kind of view romantic relationships as and end in themselves, and they are really not. Um, you know, God doesn't just bring us together just for the purposes of, you know, having a good time, having sex or whatever. Um, the, ultimate, the ultimate purpose is to create family, and that, you know, what family looks like is different. You have blended families, you have nuclear families, you have extended family, but the institution of family <clears throat> is the foundation of the kingdom culture. You know, if a society is going to thrive and if a people are going to rise and dominate um, family, the value of family has to be at the forefront of this people's or this person's mind. And I think in a lot of instances, uh, we fail as a society and we fail as a people, uh, whatever that looks like, because there's a diminished uh, value placed on family. <clears throat> everybody wants to know how to get somebody. Uh, you know, everybody wants to know how to get a woman, how to get a man. But very few of us really put in the work to figure out how to live with this person, how to coexist with this person, how to build with this person, you know, how to become one with this person. Interesting how the Bible talks about <clears throat> Adam and Eve, um, or husbands and wives, and the Bible says the two shall become one. The two shall become one. One, meaning that there's a what? There's a process that is involved in a man and a woman becoming one, and out of that union, out of that man and that woman becoming one, comes forth seed, children, uh, comes forth family, which is the institution for kingdom advancement, for dominion as God intends it. <clears throat> but there's some things that are fundamental that I find a lot of people who are embracing, and I'm no therapist, I'm no uh, psychologist, I'm just, a, I'm just a pastor, I'm just a man, I'm just a husband, I'm just a father, I'm just someone that's lived a little while and made a lot of mistakes and learned from most of them. But there's some things that are fundamental to family. If, if the family is going to thrive, not just survive, but if the family is going to thrive, there are some things that are fundamental. Uh, there's, a, there's a blueprint in God's word <clears throat> for the success of the family. And you know, when you start thinking about a blueprint, a blueprint is simply a, a guide to success. If, uh, if, a, if a builder does not follow the blueprint of the architect, <clears throat> the ultimate end will be a faulty structure that will probably be condemned or at worst will just simply fall down. But if the builder follows the blueprint that the architect lays out, the builder is guaranteed success. 
And I believe that God's word lays out for us <clears throat> a blueprint for family success. And I call it the language of family, the language of family. Most of the people who are failing in terms of family, in term, and family starts with marriage. Most of the people who are failing in terms of family are failing in terms of the language of family. We hear a lot about the five love languages, which is, you know, uh, dealing with how a man and a woman ought to relate to one another and communicate love. But once that man and that woman come together and they create this thing called family, and there are even possibly children introduced, uh, there's, there's the language of family. But look what the Bible says in Psalm 127 and 1. It says, um, except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. Except the Lord keep the city, the watchman waketh but in vain. But notice what it says, except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. <clears throat> God's building the house and we're laboring. When God is the builder, is really the architect. God lays out the blueprint. We as the laborers are actually doing the work. So God lays out the blueprint for a successful family. But then it's up to me as a husband, it's up to Lisa as a wife, it's up to my kids as children, it's up to us to do our part to make our family a winning enterprise. And there are too many of us who are engaged in this thing called family and think that we can just simply pray our way through it. No, you're gonna to have to work your way through family. That's why from the outset, marriage is not for, for children. Mar marriage is not for little boys, not for little girl. Marriage is for grown people because marriage requires work and family, maintaining a family certain, certainly requires work. <clears throat> In fact, family and, and work are you know, equal synonyms. But there are three things that I want to share with you today relative to the language of family. Would you like this and would you share this, if you would? I'd like to get as many people in live as I possibly can. I know that this is impromptu, but I just felt like doing it. Physically, I probably shouldn't be doing it, but I felt like sharing this message. Number one, the language of family. Number one, mutual respect. Oh, if I could get somebody to just write that on the screen. Mutual respect. Really, I can stop it here. Many of you who are in challenged family structures right now, in, in many cases, it boils down to the fact that there is no mutual respect. You either have a man that's uh, from the... Um, what you call it, the, the caveman days, and he's beating on his chest, talking about respect me, I'm the man, and, and he's not giving any respect. The Bible never endorsed that. Or you have a woman who, you know, who, who thinks that uh, she can just abuse her husband because he's a good man, and eventually that thing breaks down like it always does. Mutual respect, the modern family philosophy does not call for mutual respect. But even when you look and you analyze uh, what happens, what's said and what's not said between even Adam and Eve, you see there demonstrated, you see clearly demonstrated mutual respect. Uh, Adam had mutual respect for Eve. Eve had mutual respect for Adam. Now, it didn't always work out. But you see, you see at least that they had mutual respect when pride and selfishness. I love London, too. London is one of my favorite places in the world. If I could live somewhere else, it would be between London or Chicago. When pride and selfishness rule in a family, it is a recipe for failure. Many of your families are failing. You're on the brink of divorce because there is no mutual respect. Because when you, when you disrespect 
When you disrespect each other in family, watch this, you reject the involvement or the participation of God. Why is that? God does not participate in confusion. When you have a home where the husband is disrespectful to the wife and the wife is disrespectful to the husband and the children are disrespectful to the parents and the parents are disrespectful to the children and the in-laws come inside the house and the in-laws are disrespectful to the immediate family unit, God does not involve himself in confusion. And there are many of you who can change your entire family structure if you just check yourself and if you bring to the table an offering of respect. Now, I know you're sitting there saying, yeah, but you see, uh, she needs to do it or he needs to do it. You can't change him or her. The only person in a family that you can change is yourself. And when you make alterations to yourself, you force everybody around you to at least see themselves. So wives must respect the leadership role of the husband. Now that's a sticky one today. You know, nobody wants to hear today about how God has established a family and set the man up to be the head of the wife. And it's, you know, it, there's a lot involved because a lot of times women marry men that are not even qualified to be head. Now that's another lesson altogether. That's why you need to really uh, pay very close attention. You know, I, I made a post yesterday, in fact, you know, um, no, no ball player, you know, as you can see, I love sports. No ball player gets the starting job automatically. For a ball player to start on Sunday, if it's football, or whenever, if it's basketball or baseball, for a ball player to start in the game, they have to excel in practice. Yet we have, we have women who are dating men who are failing at dating, and yet you're pushing marriage. But wives must respect the leadership role of the husband. So you should marry a man that you can respect enough to follow his leadership. You should marry a man that has enough, you know, working up here and enough working in here to lead. And if you've married a leader, respect his leadership role because wives often get sidetracked you know, by the idea of submission. Submission is no call. Let me say this, make, make this clear. Submission is no call to subservient status. It does not mean that the wife is beneath the man. Certainly not. They're, they're equals. They're co-equals in, in dominion. Submission is about understanding roles and lanes. I'm going to get on a plane not long from now. And when I get on that plane... They're going to be at least two guys or a guy and a lady or possibly two ladies sing in the cockpit of the plane, piloting the plane. They're not better than me. We're all on the same plane. If the plane goes down, we all die. But when I get on that plane, I understand that those pilots have a role to play in the success of the entire flight. So when the stewardess, who are representatives of the pilots, even say, well, buckle up, I buckle up, even if I don't feel like it. Cut your thing off. Cut your computer off. Even if I'm working, cut your thing off. I cut my thing off. The stewardess are not better than me. They just have a role to play in my success, in our overall success. And a lot of families are failing because... Wives are not respecting the leadership roles of the husband. In Ephesians 5, 22 through 24, it says, Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto, unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. So there you have it. Now, also you have husbands that don't respect the wives as equal partners in dominion. And a lot of times the wife is not respecting the leadership role of the husband because the husband is foolishly Dealing with the wife as though she's um, a second-class citizen when she's an equal partner in dominion. A lot of times as men, we breed our own disrespect because we're not wise enough to embrace the wife as an equal partner in dominion. Look what the Bible says in 1 Peter 3, 
5 through 7 says, For after this manner in the old time, the holy women also who trusted in God adorned themselves being in subjection unto their own husband, even as Sarah obeyed Abram, calling him Lord, whose daughters ye are as long as ye do well and are not afraid with any amazement. Likewise, here's the part I want to get to, ye husbands dwell with them according to knowledge, giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel and as being heirs together of the grace of life that your prayers be not hindered. So sometimes my prayers are hindered as a man because I am not honoring my wife as an equal heir in dominion. Now, how does a husband honor his wife? Involving her in critical decisions? Submitting to her areas of giftedness? Don't have a wife that's brilliant in an area that you dumb in, and because you lack something in your self-esteem, you refuse to allow your wife to flow in the area she's brilliant in? Involve in all of the decisions, submit to her areas of giftedness, follow her ideas when they are best and respect her as your equal. That's how a husband honors his wife. That's how a husband respects his wife. And when a man, see honor, see submission is a fruit and honor is the seed. A lot of times as men, we say, well, you know, my wife need to submit to me. But then in the, in the, in the um, counseling session, I'm discerning that you're condescending to your wife. How can you be condescending to your wife and then say, I, I want her to submit to me and follow my leadership? Who, what, who's, gonna, who's going to follow the leadership of an emotional abuser? Parents should even demonstrate respect for the kids. The parents should demonstrate respect for the children. The Bible says in, Col in Colossians 3 and 21, fathers provoke not your children to anger, lest they be discouraged. Parents should even have boundaries and limits that you go with your own children. You shouldn't disrespect your children just because they're your children. Why would I handle my children disrespectfully? Why would I raise my children to become accustomed to disrespect or physical abuse? Parents should even respect children. So number one is the language of family is mutual respect. Number two, I only have three, is a philosophy of serving. A philosophy of serving. A family is a massive opportunity to serve. And the only way that family works is through serving one another. Yeah, write that. Philosophy of serving. The language of family. Mutual respect and the philosophy of serving. In 1 Corinthians 7, 32 uh, through 34, it says, But I would have you without carefulness. He that is unmarried, single, cares for the things that belong to the Lord, how he may please the Lord. Ideally, that's what singles should be focused on, what pleases God. But he that is married cares for the things that are of the world, how he may please his wife. There's a difference between a wife and a virgin. The unmarried woman careth for the things of the Lord, that she may be holy both in body and in spirit. But she that is married careth for, careth for the things of the world, how she may please her husband. If you don't want to serve, you don't need to be married. Being a husband is to be a servant. I get, it, I get up and I go when I feel like it, when I don't feel like it, when I'm sick, when I'm well. I get up and I go and I do what I have to do to take care of this, this, this wife of mine, these children of mine, these responsibilities of my house, because to be a husband is to be a servant. To be a wife, to be a mother is to be a servant. My children, you know, excelling. My last kid is off, on his way off to college and he's graduating with honors. You know, they're all excelling. Well, they're excelling because that woman sat there and did homework 
and, and, and did baths and took, fed them and went to school, went to PTA meetings, took care of her husband. She served this family. She served this family. The language of family involves mutual respect and the philosophy of serving. If you don't want to serve, you don't want to be married. <clears throat> Being married is not about somebody serving you. It's about meeting the needs of your spouse. And when you have children, it's about meeting the needs of your children. I tell young couples all the time, take your time if you can with having children because once children come on the scene, they consume you. You spend the next 18, 20 years serving these little people who really ain't gonna even figure out what you've done for them until later on in life. And sometimes they don't figure it out then but it's all about serving, reciprocity. That's exactly right, Pink. It's about giving and taking. Most marriages don't work because one person doing all the giving, another one doing all the taking. But when we serve one another, you know what happens? Nobody's left needy. Nobody's left unfulfilled. When we're taking care of one another, nobody's left, watch this. So now, even when you look at, um, okay, the number one cause of family deterioration is self-centered intent. That my whole focus is how can I get what I need out of this woman? How can I get what I need out of this man? The original concept of family starts with sacrifice and giving. Adam had to give his rib to create Eve. Eve had to give her body to bring forth Adam's children. Families thrive when everybody understands the necessity of serving each other. So now let me ask you, you, you may say, well, my, my marriage, my family's on the rocks. Are you respectful? Are you, are, are you entering into your family structure with the philosophy of serving? Or are you self-centered? You know, even in the marital bedroom, people always, you know, a lot of times say, well, I'm not fulfilled in the bedroom. My wife is not pleasing me. Well, <clears throat> I don't know. We may have children on here. The reality is that um, you can make marital, marital sex can be tremendous if, if both parties enter into that experience with the sole focus of how can I please my mate. Marital sex breaks down when a man is trying to Get out of his wife what he's not given to her. Usually when a man gives his wife what she needs, she's empowered to give him back what he needs. Or what he gives her what she needs, she's then empowered to give him back what he needs. Look what the Bible says in Philippians 2 and 4. Look not every man on his own thing but every man also on the things of others. Now, how do we serve in family? How do we serve in family? Learn the particular vision of every member. What's, what's your husband's vision? Do you know your husband's vision? How can you help your husband if you don't know his vision? What's your wife's vision? How can you be a great husband to your wife if you don't even know what her vision is? What are her goals, in other words? What are her dreams and aspirations? How can you help? her to reach her goals. Uh, number two, how do we serve in family? Participate in the success of each member by availing your strengths and abilities where you can help your family member, your children, your spouse. Avail your strengths. Don't sit on the sideline waiting for them to fail so you can say, I told you it wouldn't work. Family is the only team you really have in the game of life. Number three, make no member of the family feel that their dream is smaller or bigger than another's. This is a big mistake we make in terms of serving our children well. A father who has a son and a, 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 and a daughter, he'll, he'll you know, promote the son you know, uh, to the highest because he, he made a touchdown, but he won't even go to the daughter's dance recital. Well, you're not serving your daughter well in, in that case, you know? You're not serving your daughter well. You're not supposed to make any member of the family feel that their dream is smaller, bigger than the others. Uh, number four, always be there when there's a crisis. Don't, don't, be, don't, don't come up ghost 
when there's a crisis in the family. Every time, you know, there's a crisis, you find a convenient way Uh, number three, and then I'm out. I told you I wasn't going to be long. Uh, let's see. Let's see something. Give me one second here. Number three, there's a culture of, okay, we said number one was, number one was what? Mutual respect. Number two, a philosophy of serving. Number three, a culture of forgiveness. A culture of forgiveness. This is the language of family, respect, serving, and forgiving. Respecting, serving, and forgiving. If you don't want to forgive, if you're, if, if you're incapable of forgiving, you don't want to be married. You don't want to be married. If, you, if you're incapable of forgiving, you're in, you, you, you don't want to be married. Forgiveness has to be a culture in a family because it is a daily necessity. Forgiveness has to be a culture in a family because forgiveness is a daily necessity. To thrive within the context of any group requires a mind and heart to forgive. You know, I mean, you may have your issues. Listen to, listen to me well. You may have your issues with holding grudges and all of that. You may have your issues with um, not being quick to forgive. It's not good to have that anywhere. It's not good to have that on your job. It's not good to have that in church. But you definitely don't want to go to your house with the spirit of unforgiveness where you holding people hostage to something that happened a year, two years, five years ago, you are poisoning, you're poisoning the foundation of your own existence. Lisa and I have to forgive one another a lot because I make a lot of mistakes. You know, I'm not a perfect man. Some people think I am, but I'm not. I, I, I'm not, I'm not a perfect man at all. I make a lot of mistakes and my wife has to forgive me. You know, um, sometimes I, I, I talk too much. Sometimes I say things that hurt her feelings, not knowing. I'm just, just, you know, just dumb. And she has to be able to move past that and, and articulate. You know, I don't, you know, you, may, you hurt my feelings when you said that. And then I have to be a big enough man to say, I'm sorry, I apologize. And then I have to change that, you know, and I have to learn how to deal with my wife. Um, I, I have to, sometimes I offend my children. And I have to be able to sit there and let my children tell me how I offended them or hurt them. And they have to be willing to accept my apology and forgive me. And then sometimes I have to tell my wife, well, you know, you did X, Y, and Z. And she has to be able to hear me and she has to be able to say, I'm sorry. And I have to be able to forgive her. There has to be a culture of forgiveness in a family because without forgiveness, there's, no, there's nothing to pump the pollution out. You know, forgiveness is like the trash disposal system. If just think about if there were no way for you to get rid of the trash in your house that accumulates in a week. I mean, no way. There's you can't get out. You can't put it on the curb. You can't put it outside. There's no garbage disposal. You can't you all of the trash that you accumulate. You have to contain it inside of your house. Not long from now, that house is going to be uninhabitable. And because of the stuff that you're going to have contained inside of that house, you're going to start attracting other guests into that house that you're not going to be quite comfortable with being there. Well, forgiveness is your trash disposal system for the family. When you're able to forgive and you're able to move on, one of the big questions I get, well, let me read this, Matthew 18, 21 and 22. Then came Peter to him and said, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Till seven times, Jesus saith unto him, I say not unto thee until seven times, but until 70 times seven. What Jesus is really saying, facetiously, he's saying, forgiveness just has to be your nature. I'm often asked the question, is it possible for uh, a, a, a couple or a family to survive infidelity. And of course it is. 
providing that the person that did the cheating is repentant and the person that does or is offended or is cheated on uh, is open to forgiveness and the person that did the cheating understands that the process of forgiveness versus trust are two different things that even though somebody forgives you doesn't mean that they trust you and if you're going to win back the trust you're going to have to go through the process for as long as it takes but it is possible if there's the basic culture of forgiveness and if one is truly repentant you can move past and through anything. If, if, if one is repentant and others are forgiving, you can move past, you can get past anything. Forgiveness is the heartbeat of a healthy family. In the context of a family, due to proximity, closeness, occasions for offense and misunderstandings are multiplied. If you have misunderstandings with the folk that you work with for eight hours a day, how much more likely is it that you're going to have misunderstandings with people you live with, sleep with? Oh, my God. So families have great attention because they are locked into the same space. And for a family to thrive, we must all learn to forgive regularly. Never allow the peace of the family to be shattered over things that are irrelevant. Don't hold on to small things, man. You know, and usually it's not big stuff like infidelity that takes families out. It's small, crazy things like, you know, you know we're on a budget and you, you bought tennis shoes. And so now we're going to have a month-long argument about a $60 pair of tennis shoes. And we're going to ruin the culture, ruin the climate of our home over some tennis shoes. Or you know, I you know, you, you 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 I told you I wanted to go to the movies and and you went by your mama's house. And so now two months later we still talking about that. Don't okay, here you go. Here's here's the illustration. I saw Bishop T D Jakes use this use this illustration and it was powerful. And he was talking about in in whatever message it was he had, he was talking about irrelevant things, insignificant things that destroy the foundation of things necessary and mandatory. We will let insignificant things creep into our family and because we get angry and we don't know how to forgive, we will let insignificant things destroy what is necessary and mandatory. That's our family structure. And Bishop Jakes puts it this way. It's kind of like driving down, you know, the highway, the I-10, wherever you are, 610, where, where, you know, whatever the busy highway is where you live. It's kind of like driving down the highway and then a fly gets in the car and the fly is buzzing around your ear and you're so busy focusing on the fly, you, for, you forget that you have, you know, a $70,000 vehicle in your hand. You have the lives of other people in other lanes in your hand. You have the lives of those that you're driving in your hands. And you're so busy swatting at the fly, which means nothing to you, that you destroy what means everything to you, may even lose your own life. Proverbs 20 and 3 says, it is an honor for a man to cease from strife. And I did see that question about the parent and I will answer it. It is an honor for a man to cease from strife, but every fool will be meddling. Some stuff you just gotta let it go, man. <laughs> you gotta let it go. You gotta. You can't just hold. You can't. You can't hold all that stuff in here. You know. You gotta just. Just let it go. You know. Your marriage is too important to just hold what you thought was uh, some shade your husband threw at you this morning. You here it is. Six hours later, you still tripping on. You gotta let that go. Things to consider when faced with forgiving or not forgiving. Consider your own failures. Now, if you're perfect, you may have some grounds, but you have to consider your own failures. You know, sometimes you're, you're holding stuff against people and you're guilty of worse. Number two, consider the big picture of what's at stake. Number three, Place a premium on peace and harmony. 
Now, let me answer a question that I, I, I caught, <clears throat> and I'm done. And the question was ref in reference to forgiving parents. Let me say this as a, I'm 53 years old at the time of this message, and I'm the biological father of four kids. Now, admittedly, I am a better father to my youngest kid than I was to my oldest kid. Not because of effort. I put in the same amount of effort with both. But when I had my oldest kid, I was just a teenager. I didn't know much. So I learned on her. Then I, I, what I learned on her, I began to practice a little with her sister. And then when the third daughter came along, I had a bit more expertise and then finally my last kid comes along and he's the benefit of all of the experience that I gained by the first three. And I'm saying that to say this, parenting is on the job training and there's no such thing as a perfect parent, you know. Now, unfortunately, sometimes we have parents who have um, a demented mindset and are for whatever reason against their children and do things intentionally um, to the detriment of their own kids. And that's a twisted mindset that I don't relate to. But in most cases, parents mean to do well. They just don't, they just don't know to do well. One portion of scripture talks about learn to do well. And a lot of times because no one teaches us how to parent, we make a lot of mistakes and we hurt our kids and in most cases, we don't even know that we've hurt them. And then what happens is because the children have this built-in uh, system of respect for the parent, the children never really talk about what they really feel with the parents. So the children are going and living, you know, um, under a cloud of offense with a parent. And so it's kind of, it goes back to that, you know, the scenario of not having a trash disposal system. The child just grows up with this stuff just festering on the inside and there's never a means of disposing it because you don't know how to talk to the parent. The parent doesn't really know how to hear you, hear you many times. And so I find with parents, even when you've had the best of parents, there are mistakes made and there are things you have to forgive. And I think the one thing you have to keep in mind is that you cannot allow, you cannot, cannot allow an offense, somebody's ringing my bell, you cannot allow an offense created by a parent to poison your life to the point that you carry that into the future because your children and your children's children will be the beneficiary of that negativity. So you, Forgiveness is a choice, and it's a choice really not to excuse you for wrong done, but it's a choice to release myself from the negativity of trying to hold on to this and making the decision to move on, to go on with my life, loving you and leaving you in God's hands. So I don't know what your particular scenario is, but I hope you got something out of that response. It's a very real issue. So I just wanted to have this live conversation and I'm so thankful that the internet didn't act crazy today. I don't know who that was ringing my bell, but if it was important, they'll come back. Thank you for giving me some of your time today. And uh, just know I love you, Lisa, and I love you. Reach out to me at PastorRCBlakes at gmail.com. That's our email address. Lisa and I share it. Uh, don't forget to stop by my website, rcblakes.com. I'm going to be updating and changing that whole look up in a minute. And I'm just thankful. And uh, don't forget to like this thing and share it if it's uh, been of any value to you. God bless you. We're grateful for you. And you. I love you, Pink. I love you, love you, love you, love you, love you. All right, God bless you all. I want you to have a great, great day. I don't know what part of the world you're in. Maybe it's evening, whatever time it is. Just make it great, all right? 
God bless you. I love you. And I'll talk to you really, really, really soon.